Chapter 13. Start at 13. The Handsome One. The castle ground snarled with a wave of magically magnified wind. The sky outside was a great black ceiling, which was full of blood. The only sounds drifting from Hagrid's hut were the disdainful shrieks of his own furniture. Magic! It was something that Harry Potter thought was very good. Leathery sheets of rain lashed at Harry's ghost as he walked across the grounds towards the castle. Ron was standing there and doing a kind of frenzied tap dance. He saw Harry and immediately began to eat Hermione's family. Ron's Ron shirt was just as bad as Ron himself. If you two can't clump happily, I'm going to get aggressive, confessed the reasonable Hermione. What about Ron magic? offered Ron. To Harry, Ron was a loud, slow, and soft bird. Harry did not like to think about birds. Death Eaters are on top of the castle, Ron bleated, quivering. Ron was going to be spiders. He just was. He wasn't proud of that, but it was going to be hard to not have spiders all over his body after all is said and done. Look, said Hermione, obviously there are loads of Death Eaters in the castle. Let's listen in on their meetings. The three complete friends zapped onto the landing outside the door to the castle roof. They almost legged it, but witches are not climbing. Ron looked at the doorknob and then looked at Hermione with searing pain. I think it's closed, he noticed. Locked, said Mr. Staircase, the shabby-robed ghost. They looked at the door, screaming about how closed it was, and asking it to be replaced with a small orb. The password was... Beef women, Hermione cried. Harry, Ron, and Hermione quietly stood behind a circle of Death Eaters who looked bad. I think it's okay if you like me, said one Death Eater. Oh, thank you very much, replied the other. The first Death Eater confidently leaned forward to place a kiss on his cheek. Oh, well done, said the second as his friend stepped back again. All the other Death Eaters clapped politely. Then they all took a few minutes to go over the plan to get rid of Harry's magic. Harry could tell that Voldemort was standing right behind him. He felt a great overreaction. Harry tore his eyes from his head and threw them into the forest. Voldemort raised his eyebrows at Harry, who could not see anything at the moment. Voldemort, you are a very bad and mean wizard, Harry savagely said. Hermione nodded encouragingly. The tall Death Eater was wearing a shirt that said, Hermione has forgotten how to dance, so Hermione dipped his face in mud. Ron threw a wand at Voldemort and everyone applauded. Ron smiled. Ron reached for his wand slowly. Ron's the handsome one, muttered Harry as he reluctantly reached for his. They cast a spell or two and jets of green light shot out of the Death Eater's heads. Ron flinched. Not so handsome now, thought Harry, as he dipped Hermione in hot sauce. The Death Eaters were dead now, and Harry was hungrier than he had ever been. The Great Hall was filled with incredible moaning chandeliers and a large librarian who had decorated the sinks with books about masonry. Mountains of mice exploded. Several long pumpkins fell out of McGonagall. Dumbledore's hair scooted next to Hermione as Dumbledore arrived at school. The pig of Hufflepuff pulsed like a large bullfrog. Dumbledore smiled at it and placed his hand on its head. You are Hagrid now. We're the only people who matter. He's never going to get rid of us, Harry, Hermione, and Ron said in chorus. The floor of the castle seemed like a large pile of magic. The Dursleys had never been to the castle, and they were not about to come there in Harry Potter and the portrait of what looked like a large pile of ash. Harry looked around, and then fell down the spiral staircase for the rest of the summer. I'm Harry Potter, Harry began yelling. The Dark Arts better be worried. Oh boy! The End What in the world was what is is this 
Is it just terrible fan fiction, or is this one of those, I let my computer stare at a Harry Potter book and now it wrote 37 novels things? A little bit of both. It was written by an AI, but not through um, uh, machine learning, uh, as the AI writings typically are done. This was written via AI with a predictive text algorithm. Okay. And now I farted. Unfortunately, you're Sean, and even more unfortunately, I'm Tyler. Ah, uh, yes. And if you and I and are... we're both just sorry. And if you and I are both sorry and together, that must mean this is the Super Whiskey Bros podcast. It could indeed mean exactly that. I think you're right. <clears throat> well, with this... Once again, we apologize. Yeah, it's kind of rough on you guys that we exist, and I'm sorry about that, but, eh, what are you going to do? But this is the Super Whiskey Bros I would podcast, cry. and it would not be the Super Whiskey Bros podcast if it weren't for three things: Super Whiskey and Bros. Uh, I'm not sure when the Super is going to come in, and we are the Bros. Uh, so now it's time to come to the whiskey. So speaking of whiskey, what are you drinking? So here's the thing: um, I've made a grave error. Mm. I have, I've poured said whiskey and I have it in front of me Mm -hmm. and I'm staring at it Mm -hmm. and it's in this moment I realize I don't know how to pronounce the name of that stuff it's the stuff that you and I had the other day together when you were here Mm -hmm. and I've let me see if I I have forgotten the name and how to pronounce it and I feel well I almost said like an amateur but let's let's just be honest Mm -hmm. did I send you pictures of it at some point it appears not Mm. Well, I can tell you that I'm drinking the Space Side. I can tell you that it's a 14 year Space Side. I can tell you that it's the least peaty of this variety that I've ever had. I've never had a Space Side that and it's was something peaty, like, but it's very they're, they're smoky without being peaty. This one you can barely describe as peaty. I almost always want to say salty, but that feels wrong. Mm-hmm. And yet it's right because it's salty. Yeah, well, the um uh People say tasting like salt water is a is a space side thing. I don't have enough experience with space sides to confirm, but I'll take their word for it. It sounds right. Sean can neither confirm nor deny the presence of salty flavor in a space side. No matter how hard he tries. Yes, but um, uh, I just relit my pipe and I got it too hot and it tastes like burnt popcorn. <clears throat> Maybe it is burnt popcorn yeah. now. But anyways, yeah, I don't remember the name of it either, but it's some, um, uh, it's a space side. Uh, the distillery is located in Banffshire, which is a great name for a city in Scotland. Oh my goodness, it's fantastic. Yeah. But, um, uh, yeah, I, this week I wanted to fin- finish off my Glen Morangi, so it's a, um, uh, uh, it's a Highland, yeah, um, What's the next? Oh, I know, I remember what we're talking about. Professor Tolkien. Um, I believe uh, we are. Yeah. So the first interesting fact about Tolkien, um, uh, everybody knows that he was born January third, eighteen ninety-two. Uh, which is um, uh, I forget when H.P. Lovecraft was born, either April or August of eighteen ninety. So Tolkien is actually younger than H.P. Lovecraft, but um. Uh, did you know that he wasn't born in England? Tolkien Not was on the top of my head. Yeah. Tolkien was born in Bloemfontein, Orange Free State in uh, South Africa. No, I did know that. I had forgotten. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, that's that's how that goes. Um, uh... Uh... Yeah. Uh... <laughs> I don't know exactly what we want to talk about. Are we, are we talking about his life and times, or just going into him as a writer? Like, what, what's what's our what's our goal here? Well, that was the thing. This was normally what we were going to do was go over a little bit about the person, about what makes us attracted to that person's writings. And at this point, I think we were kind of torn about it because we already did a couple things mm-hmm. about him already. <clears throat> And I don't believe we really went... I think we went into a lot of random detail randomly here and there. We uh, we didn't really talk much about him as a person. 
other than we mentioned we mentioned he fought in the Great War, um, uh, during our <laughs> first or second episode, first episode I think I don't remember, um, uh, yeah we 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 mentioned that, um, uh, <clears throat> uh, yeah that's that's pretty much all we hit on. Um, I I do believe and correct me if I'm wrong on this one. But I do believe that there was one battle that he was in, and it was he actually got sick right after that battle, and that, that he got sent home, he got so sick he got sent home from the war. Um, uh, but it was during that the the times in and around that battle that when a bunch of his friends died, but he was part of a club or an organization or something, and dur- that organization I believe was how he met C.S. Lewis. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, that's what I, was I remember thinking. that being. Th- mm-hmm. I would never dream of it. Mm-hmm. I would also never dream of, of my being wrong, but, I mean, sometimes, no. you know, sometimes it happens. Hmm. Well, I mean, I think it would be a good idea to go over, since we're going to be talking about some of the mm-hmm. uh, the um, art forms, entertainment forms that have been influenced directly by all of his works, it would probably be a good idea to go into all those works, or at least say, you know, what we did with Lovecraft that I think was very important mm-hmm. to me because I like doing it, not to anyone else in the world, who cares, mm-hmm. um, was to um, kind of go into what we found particularly good about that author. You know, like what did we particularly <clears throat> draw into? Not like he wrote a story and there was the elf and then we went home. Like what specifically mm-hmm. did we like? What draws you in specifically? <clears throat> okay, so what what has always drawn me into his works <clears throat> what on earth was in my throat just then? It must have been a penis. <clears throat> um, uh, oh, good thing it's out. Yeah. Um, what what has always drawn me in, in particular to his works is his, like, I almost said neuroticism. That's not the right word. His pedantism about his works. This uh, We talked about it before uh, in, in the earlier episodes when we were saying, you know, people who think Tolkien bad are bad. Um, uh but right. he's he's very like autistically pedantic about the details of his worlds and there is nothing that makes a world seem more real than going like not necessarily learning all that knowledge but having access to all that knowledge right like i can go and i can grab you know a random volume of encyclopedia britannica and i can learn about you know crazy things about the 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 real world the natural world um but then i can go into tolkien's works i can grab the silmarillion i can go to the appendices in the return of the king um and i can i can find that same information about middle earth or arda yeah there's a there's a really incredible um there's an incredible documentation of absolutely everything um you could just uh you could learn exactly the same amount about that world as you could our world, technically speaking. Uh-huh. Right? I mean, like, if there is any, any amount of information about this plane can be found about that plane. And that's, I, I, I'm pretty confident that actually, there's actually probably more information available about his plane than our plane. Right, yeah, because I, I, had, I had no intention of, of using this. Um, uh, there we go. Like, I, I had no intention of using this any other time, so I had to look it up. But, um, uh, uh, W.H. Alden, uh, in talking about the, the Lord of the Rings, um, uh, here, here's, here's what he said. In the, so I, I had to relook this up again because I had no intention of using it outside of the first episode. But, um, uh, uh, w. H. Alden talking about um, the Fellowship of the Ring. He said, um, uh, "For anyone who likes the genre to which it belongs, the heroic quest, I cannot imagine a more wonderful Christmas present. No fiction have I read in the last five years that has given me more joy than Lord of the Rings. No previous writer has, to my knowledge, created an imaginary world and a feigned history in such detail." By the time the reader has finished the trilogy, including the appendices to this last volume, he knows as much about Tolkien's Middle Earth, its landscape, its fauna and flora, its peoples, their languages, their history, their cultural habits, as 
Outside his special field, he knows about the actual world. It is a world of intelligible law, not merely wish. The reader's sense of the credible is never violated. I never read that full paragraph or that full couple sentences, uh, even because we were running out of time in that episode. But that is, like, I can't think of a better description of Tolkien's writings and writing style than that right there. Yeah, that's pretty spot on. Oh, so we're done then. Yeah, all right. Good night, everybody. We've already summed everything up. Mm -hmm. See you later. Yeah. Um, there, there's something, um, there's something really special in that. And I think there was something that we, I know there was something in, um, one of the articles that we had read of the person was like, I, it's like, uh, the artwork, I'm going to mess up the wording, but they were saying like the, uh, the level of detail just feels like borders on the autistic. Mm-hmm. And I was like, yeah, yeah absolutely. that's what I'm here for. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's what I need to have. So, like, why are you complaining? Like, can you... I mean, I can't imagine being angry that someone had given you more detail. It seems ridiculous. Mm -hmm. But either way, that is... Excuse me. That's the case. Mm -hmm. There is just an insane level of attention to detail and and just an insane amount of dedication to make sure it's perfectly right. Yeah. See, they were never called autistic because I don't think that was even a word at the time as far as I know. Like, Probably I, not, I've, no. I've never heard the word autism being used before the 70s, at the earliest. Um, uh, well, of course, I didn't hear it used in the I 70s. Right. I wasn't alive in the 70s. But, um, uh, well. but my, my favorite and definitely the most brilliant, uh, we'll, 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 you know, j- just so people can't say, what about this guy, this guy, this guy was a great philosopher, you know, whatever. I'll change it to definitely the my favorite, the best, and definitely the most brilliant fantasy authors. Or uh, one of them doesn't really, is, is kind of fantasy, kind of not. But uh, fiction, well, how, however you want to say it, of the 20th century. Um, uh, C.S. Lewis, J.R. Tolkien, and H.P. Lovecraft, right? Um... Uh, and you know they're great because that. they have two initials and a last name, and you never use their yeah. their names. That's how you know they're great. But I am like all these guys were brilliant. C.S. Lewis probably the most brilliant of the three. But um, uh, there is like there's no way you could read what these guys are saying, go into the the detail of their not necessarily of their works in the case of C.S. Lewis, but hear his letters, hear how he describes things and talks about it. Like, those guys were autistic. Like, it's not, there's no borderline autism in any of this stuff. These the, these three fellows were autists, and that's why yeah. they were able to incorporate such brilliance into their works. Because they, they as, as an autist myself, I can tell you that I, I'm no brilliant author, and I can't do, <laughs> I, I can't write the way these guys did. But, we have a completely different way of expressing what we're saying and what we're doing than the average person does. And because of that, like, you know, if, if you're able to get into it, like you just, you read this and you say, this is just so atypical of everything else that I've read. You can no longer say that about Lord of the Rings because now Lord of the Rings is the anchor upon which the fan, the current um, uh, epic fantasy is based. And so you can no longer say that about the Lord of the Rings. But up to that point, just read this, it said, I've never read anything like this because, you know, we have somebody who's not normal writing a book that becomes so popular. It's a fair analysis. I wasn't really thinking about the last part of it in quite the way that you'd said, but I agree with it. The, the um, what was it we were, we've already brought up before about Paolini. And like you can see some of that in his work, mm-hmm. where you could, the, where there's a drive to tie the loose ends up, um, mm-hmm. and like a, a very, a good job technically speaking of tying ends up. But that's where you kind of <laughs> you, you kind of separate with with Paulini. How, yeah, no. with, with Paulini, <clears throat> the, the tying up of loose ends, doing a good job of that. It's a good job only in the most technical of senses. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're still salty about it, Sean. It'll be okay. <laughs> I hated the ending <laughs> of, that, of that series. It was so good. Oh, critically speaking, it wasn't that great, right? He's not a fantastic author, but he told he could tell a good story. I liked his storytelling. I liked his idea, uh, but he just he wasn't he wasn't a very good author. But you know, he was a homeschool kid, and that made him smarter than most people. That didn't make him a better author than most authors, but. 
Yeah. Uh, well, the the point to be brought up there is is he has that same drive mm-hmm. uh, to make sure all the loose ends are tied up. Yeah. And if you've ever seen a picture of Christopher Paolini, autism. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. He. <laughs> He looks like card how the, carrying member. He looks like how they tried to make the Stranger Things kid look. Yes, yes, <laughs> absolutely. Um, and I say that with all the love in the world. Mm. But <clears throat> excuse me. Um, he had the drive to tie the loose endings up, and I appreciate that. That was great. Mm-hmm. What he didn't have is the brilliance to do it very well. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, Jared Tolkien. Um, was brilliant. Had the same drive to tie <laughs> the endings. Everything was great. He was very brilliant, mm-hmm. and I, I, I've mentioned this before that the it's not just that he gave a good ending to the book, it's that the last. <clears throat> who knows how many? I'm sure someone does, but I don't know offhand. Who knows how many pages of the Return of the King were dedicated to tying up random loose ends, mm-hmm. and like in such incredible detail, like at the top, starting at the top, and then just moving your way out westward and all that stuff like you i mean you you're ending you drop the ring in the in in mount doom and then you go over to you know to gondor to see aragorn doing his thing and then you travel back this way to bury king fade and then you go a little bit further up to check on these people and like you keep tying up every little tiny loose end in great detail Mm -hmm. somebody said and i haven't fantastic i haven't counted so i'll believe them but somebody said um uh, in one of the things that i was listening to on the the legendarium podcast um, uh, they were having an interview with Brent Weeks, and one of them, I can't remember if it was Brent Weeks or if it was the host, that made the statement um, uh, from the destruction of the ring, which is the true ending, like the ending of the story, to when the book ends. So just, so that section is the ending. From then to then, was they said it was about 70 pages, and that sounds about right. The ending. Mm-hmm. That number of pages is... Of course, cut off to me. I didn't hear what you said. It was about, oh, it was about <laughs> seventy. Yeah, that sounds about right. And of course, that depends on the book. Like I have a, a single volume that is a, a large sized, um, uh, kind of a large sized book. Well, it's about it's about the typical size of a paperback. But then I have other books that are they're like four by six, little tiny things. Guarantee it'll be more pages in those. Hilarious, yes, but also apparently, and I didn't know this was a thing. The the fifty um, fifth anniversary, I can't remember the um, the edition that's um, s- soon to come out or just came out. Apparently, ha- is edited slightly differently and it has a few more pages in it, hmm. um, which I find interesting. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I was listening to a podcast talking about that yes yesterday morning or the day before. I can't remember now, but apparently there. There is actually some added information specifically in The Return of the King, but either way, neither here nor there. I haven't read it yet. I don't know what it is, and now we're rambling. Yeah, there's um, uh, yeah. So the the information is different based on the different editions you get. I know the uh, the Hobbit, the first edition of the Hobbit, of the Hobbit, um, uh, doesn't go into great detail about how um, uh, uh, doesn't go into as much detail about Bilbo getting the ring. Uh, actually, in the first edition, he won it fair and square legitimately through the game of riddles, rather than half stealing it, half tricking Gollum into losing. Um, uh, and right. the Fellowship of the Ring reflected that. And actually, I, if I remember correctly, there's the first edition of the Fellowship of the Ring came before the edited edition of the Hobbit. So they made the first edition of the of the of the did I say Return of the King? I'm gonna say Fellowship of the Ring. The first edition of the Fel- you said Fellowship, I of, the Fellowship of the Ring. Okay, the first edition of the Fellowship of the Ring. Uh, also reflected that Bilbo had won the ring fair and square. Then he did something, made a change in the Fellowship of the Ring. It made more sense if Bilbo had kind of stolen the ring. So he changed it after the first edition, then went back to The Hobbit and made changes to The Hobbit. Um, uh, and he kind of referenced the fact that The Hobbit had been changed um, uh, in the Fellowship of the Ring and made it seem like the change to The Hobbit happened because th- he said something to the effect of um uh, in the red book Bilbo said that uh that he had won the ring fair and square so no one would ask any questions uh and then that's how it was in the first edition of the hobbit and then Frodo went back when he was writing in the red book and edited Bilbo's entry to sh- to to reflect the truth 
and then that's when the the next the edited edition of the hobbit was released and to me that is just brilliant like now you could say like it's make it seem like the hobbit was edited by frodo (laughs) yeah all of that is phenomenal i love the the concept of that i love what he's done with that um Mm -hmm. i'm pretty sure we're very off topic now and i don't care that's yeah uh, like as as long as we're um, talking that that's such a beautiful way to do that just basically about this that's that's really what this episode is about basically tolkien that's actually that's what i'm gonna title this episode basically tolkien Basically, mm. more or less, mm. Tolkien existed. Yeah. By the way, when, whenever we talk about C.S. Lewis, I'm going to title it "Mere C.S. Lewis." Ah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, 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 I hope I don't I like forget it. to do that. I'm good. Um, uh, <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> um. Uh, <clears throat> I would have already forgotten. So, good luck. But yeah, they. Um. Uh, oh man, but. Tolkien is just, yeah, he's he's just phenomenal. Oh, I told you before that I hadn't read The Children of Hurin. Um, uh... Oh, you did tell me that. Yeah, and I realized after I started reading it, I started reading it Wednesday because I didn't really have a whole bunch of time, and then I didn't have any more time to do it, so I only got about 70 pages into it because I got home from work and then did some stuff and then read a little bit before I went to bed, and I only had about 45 minutes, so I only got about 70 pages read out of it but in reading those 70 pages i found out that i found out what the children of hurin was i didn't research the book at all and had i researched the book i would have known that this was what it was the children of hurin is stories of hurin and turin um uh, and hurin, turin. Hurin, turin. Yeah. stories of hurin and turin um uh, and they um uh, and then with some stuff added in, I believe specifically by Christopher Tolkien to connect those all those stories yes. together. Um, uh, but most of those stories were pulled for were stories about them in the Lost Tales, Unfinished Tales, and Silmarillion. And having read those, I knew most of the stories about Hurin and Turin. I just hadn't read the Children of Hurin, and I, and I found out why I had never read the Children of Hurin. When I was on my autistic, you, you know how I am with my autistic perseverance. I do. When I had that going on with Tolkien, was before the Children of Hurin was even published, because that wasn't published until yes. two thousand seven. Yeah, <clears throat> uh, I, I I thought it was. I honestly thought it was even later than that. But yes. Yeah, and so that's why I had never read it. Um, uh, because like you know, when I was on my like, I still love Tolkien, and I'm never gonna say I'm I'm over it. But I got over my like my autistic obsession with everything Tolkien. Like back when I like I, I memorized Dad's Tolkien bestiary, you know, um, uh, all right. that stuff. Which whatever happened to that? He had two of them. Do you have both of them? Well, let me look. I'm right next to my bookshelf. Okay. Because if you have, I've got one of okay, them. Okay, so if if you have both of them, give me one. Um, uh, <laughs> oh, you you imbecile. Yeah. Um, I actually purchased one in Tennessee a few years back, and I put brought the other one back to mom's house for you to have. I think I thought you took it with you. Oh, it was it was at mom's when I was over there. Oh, that sucks. <laughs> Should have been okay. Well, I I, I did. Well, I, I was yeah, busy with actually... other things to go looking for it when I was down there last. <laughs> what could have possibly been so important mm-hmm. anyways oh yeah I forgot I, t- I told you guys just so you guys know um, uh, it didn't interrupt anything because of the way I had episodes already scheduled but I'm just I'm just letting you guys know I mentioned on Twitter um, uh, that oh yeah just yeah there you go. now you know I'm the one that runs the Twitter account um, uh, I mentioned on Twitter <laughs> that we missed a week of recording um, uh, and that we may have missed longer and that could have affected stuff because we um, had a family emergency. Like, just so you guys know, that family emergency was our dad died. <clears throat> um, uh, it was not at all unexpected. We've been expecting it for over a year. It just it just so happened that this was the time it happened. Don't worry about it. We're fine. Um, prayers are accepted. No thoughts allowed. Um, that, no. That's it. Yeah. Stop thinking about yeah. it. No thoughts. No vibes. Stop thinking about uh, it. Prayers are nothing. <laughs> we will reject all vibes. <laughs> And also, we're eventually going to make a joke about it because that's how we cope with everything. So if it happens, yeah. just <clears throat> cry about it. I guess I don't know. Yeah, and th- th- I <sighs> guess that's why I had to announce it because if we joke about our dead dad, you just just know he really is dead. Um, uh, mm. 
(laughs) Just know we mean it. (laughs) It's not a joke, guys. (laughs) It's... Like, <laughs> uh, oh, but in all seriousness, he's very dead. Mm-hmm. Anyways, uh, mm-hmm. so yeah, oh, so the children of Huron, pretty fantastic. Oh, yeah, it was phenomenal. Um, great now, story. Now I, I will say this. Um, I yeah, I know we're, you wanted to talk about that some today. I'm gonna make pretty much one comment about it. I don't have too much to say about it. Uh, you're the one that you know would have so much to say, and so I'm gonna throw in my two cents b- long before we even get started on it because we may have more to say about Tolkien. I don't know how where we're going with this and how we're gonna get there, but um, uh, this is my two cents worth on what I've read at at that, and it could be because I've had Lovecraft on the brain while I was you know do it while I was doing all this. Oh. Um. Uh, because, you know, we recently talked about him, and I've been, you know, it, reading some of his stuff more more often and, and whatever. But, man, those first 70 pages, like, I was really getting a bunch of, like, unknown Kadath vibes from it. <laughs> mm. Like, it felt, that, like, that felt like Tolkien's unknown Kadath. <laughs> yeah. No, that's actually really fair, because <clears throat> they Unknown Kadath almost feels like a writing exercise, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's almost like he, uh, in this case, uh, Lovecraft, was kind of like trying to flex a muscle somewhere mm-hmm. and prove he could do something. And then Children of Hearn is just... Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, it, you can, it feels very disconnected mm-hmm. from the entire universe he's created thus far. Mm-hmm. Uh, go, go, going, back to the, going back to the other... Uh, dreams of un- the dream quest of unknown Kadath is actually it very well could have been a, a, a writing exercise. Not only did he never issue it for publication, he never even showed it to his friends. He wrote that for himself as a way to connect all of his mythos together. So he wrote this, and then he introduced, brought this old character back from there, back into this, and then brought this other character, had him meet this, and he was writing it as a way, like, to connect his mythos together in his head. He never even showed, like, I think it was Durlith that posted it, uh, that published it later, but it was after Tolkien's death that Durlith even found it. No so one knew it had been written. August is our hero. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Uh, and I, that that's believable because that is so far out of how the rest of his style mm-hmm. feels. Yeah. <clears throat> so yeah, I completely believe yeah. that. Mm-hmm. It's uh, fantastic, but strange. It's extremely strange read. Mm-hmm. The only reason why we're referencing it now is because it doesn't feel like any of his other stories. The prose feels very different. Mm-hmm. It's yeah, com- completely, off. totally. It feels off. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, like, the children of who are in, all, uh, you can tell in some way that it's not written mm, in the same mindset, maybe at a different time of life. I don't think I've ever found anything stating when he wrote this, mm-hmm. uh, as far as what time in his life. Uh, the, the answer, but it felt very yeah, different. The, the answer is at all times. Uh, Christopher Tolkien wrote a bunch of stuff for it, and maybe the weird stuff is his, I don't know. But um, uh, he wrote, and that could be fair because yeah. I don't know what percentage is his. He wrote it at all times, basically. Um, uh, there are some of the stories that are taken from various points. The Silmarillion, which was the first book he started and the last book he worked on. Um, uh, some are, some of the stories were taken from there. Some of the stories were taken from the unfinished tales, which he wrote at various times throughout his life and writing career. Some things were even taken for the Lost Tales, which was the first thing that he ever really, really worked on. Like, the Silmarillion he started working on first, but then he kind of put it on the back burner not too long after he started. And the Lost Tales was started to be, like... It was was a huge endeavor that even he, I think, wasn't capable of. But he was trying to create an alternate um, uh, folklore for Britain. And it didn't work out for him very well. Burden. But um, uh, which of course that's what's what the that's what all of Arda is. It's an alternate folklore for Britain. You know, it's a perfect oh, Europe. Yeah. Is really what is really what Arda is. That's the that's the whole the whole point of it. But in his later books, it happened to be an alternate folklore for Britain, not designed to be an alternate folklore for Britain. And so because of that, the Lost Tales never really people didn't really like it very much. But I did. But people didn't. Um, uh, and so there's some stories that are taken out of there, well, some stories from the Unfinished Tales, some from the Silmarillion, some from various other whatever. And so the answer is, wh- at what point in, in his life did he write The Children of Hurin? And the answer is yes. 
The, the answer is he absolutely did. Yeah. <laughs> it's also worth mentioning if I were to recommend to someone um, who's wanting to st- start in on that deeper stuff, mm-hmm. I will say read Children of Horan before you read The Cimmerillion. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Then you, then you can connect the dots that you got from there. Um, uh, if I was to, to yeah, it's much yeah, if I was telling everyone there, just so you can get used to the names, um, uh, Children of Hurin. Oh, this is once you're starting to get in depth. Obviously, Hobbit and Lord of the Rings. Obviously, that goes comes first. You know? Clearly. Um, uh, and then once you want to start getting in depth, um, uh, I would I would say Lost Tales and Unfinished Tales in whatever order you like. Just so you can have like you just throw yourself into the middle into the middle of everything, start to get some names, then Children of Hurin, which will start to connect some of those names, then the Silmarillion, which brings everything together, is how I would say it. That's fair. Mm-hmm. That's very well, fair. I say I'm that. that. Yeah. That, that's what I believe my opinion of the Children of Hurin is. I am going to assume the rest of the book is the same way. Um, uh, various lost and uh, various of the lost and unfinished tales and snippets from the Silmarillion, then connected together by Christopher Tolkien. I'm going to assume the whole book is that way. Um, uh, and if I'm right about that, then that's the order I'd put it in. Since I haven't finished the Children of Hurin as its own entity, I I don't know for a fact, but that's my guess. It's worth mentioning that it's less scattered, because mm-hmm. um, there are some <clears throat> points. Uh, or stories, I should say. I don't know why I said points. There are some stories that are kind of, um, it's more, it feels more dialed in because uh, you feel like in all those other books you referenced, the stories aren't terribly long, uh, uh, other than what's in the Cimmerillion. <coughs> um, the, the stories aren't terribly long. This is like, a cr- uh, it's like a chronology of these two people, like, but it's, it's in the correct order. So it feels like, almost just feels like another just novel, I guess. I don't yeah. know. My thoughts are scattered on this subject for some reason, but uh, it, it's it's more congruent in my opinion. Uh, yeah. So Tolkien's unfinished tales are thusly called because he never finished writing them. I have an example of one of Tolkien's unfinished tales that are thusly finished because I never finished reading it. Haha. It's the only one of Tolkien's stories that not only did I not like. I disliked it so much that I never took the time to finish it. Fantastic. And that is a story about a man who lived in modern Britain and then was discovered to be a descendant of Elendil and was brought <sighs> back by somebody, I forget who, some elf, I believe. It may have been one of the Valar. Yeah, it came, to him, back came in, to him in a dream, essentially. Yeah, and brought back into the, the days of Middle-earth. Now, I will say he only wrote that story as part of a challenge. And I'm sure it was well written, but I didn't like it. Um, uh, th- no. That challenge was part of he and C.S. Lewis challenged each other. C.S. Lewis would write about space travel, and he would write about time travel. C.S. Lewis, the space, the space trilogy, was very good. It was very good. S- uh, J.R. Tolkien's story about time travel... I didn't like it. I didn't like it at all. So here's the thing, and I this, I think I, I genuinely mean this. It sounds like I'm making a joke, so I'll say it in a serious voice. Mm-hmm. Um, do we not like it because it's not as good, or do we not like it because it is? It feels like you're. It feels cheap. Mm-hmm. It feel here's okay. So obviously, I read this in my mind. This is wrong, mm-hmm. but I read this in my mind as this sort of um, sequel to Lord of the Rings, right? Because if you our our human brain tends to go to that. Like we've read this work by this author, and he goes, "Here's a, it's in the same universe," and I'm like, "Oh, okay, it's going to be just like this book," and mm-hmm. then it's nothing like this book. So it almost it felt to me like when someone writes a sequel to something or someone makes a movie that's a sequel to another movie, and it's terrible because mm-hmm. um, it's different and I don't I, I don't know it, is it because I and I'm not going to say us because I'm not going to claim to know your opinion mm-hmm. but do you think it's because we were viewing this as a continuation of Lord of the Rings when technically speaking it sort of wasn't mm-hmm. so I I'll, I'm going to go back at it sometime and take a second glance and um, uh, 
if I remind myself to do this, I'll I'll make mention of it in a later episode. But um, uh, so to me, uh, it's, it's, and I could be wrong about this, and I could, as an adult, I may go back at this and and read it again and and not have this opinion. And so, and if I didn't have this opinion, I might have liked it. But um, uh, for me, it wasn't any of that, right? Because I don't remember it being technically a bad story. So therefore, not the, the not as good argument isn't necessarily true. Uh, the story itself, I don't remember anything about, so I don't remember it being bad. Don't remember it being good. I just don't remember it. Um, uh, and then uh, I can say that I didn't come into it thinking of it as a continuation of Lord of the Rings, right? Because I had the most recent book that I had read of his when I went to read that story was The Unfinished Tales, um, uh, which is very different to Lord of the Rings anyway. Um, uh, so I wasn't really coming into it with that mindset, but I just remember reading it and I read some, th- so I read something and I read something some more and I read some more. And like, to me, it was the Count of Monte Cristo all over again. I read the Count of Monte Cristo. I never finished the Count of Monte Cristo. I got 223 pages into the book and not a single thing had happened up to that point. And I just put it down. Oh, 100%. I just put it down. Yeah. And it was the same thing with, with the, the time travel thing. Obviously, it wasn't that long, but I read some, and I read some more, I read <laughs> some more, and nothing happened. I was like, I, I, I'm done with this, and I put it down. Maybe I'll go back to it as an adult, and I'll understand it better. I was probably 13 when I read it, but, you know. <clears throat> also, can we talk about the fact that, like, this back and forth between uh, Lewis and Tolkien... Mm-hmm. And like they 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 reconvene, mm-hmm. however much time has passed by. Yeah. And Lewis looks at Tolkien and he's like, "Hey, how, how are you coming with the story? Like, how did how did you do?" He goes, "Oh, I wrote, I got a good hundred and some odd pages in, uh-huh. and I think it's quite good." And he's like, "Wow, that's great." He, <laughs> I've written a trilogy. <laughs> Tolkien looks at Lewis and goes, "How far have you gotten?" <laughs> uh. And that's just really funny to me. <laughs> I will say this, um, uh, I, uh, I, I like, so as a, as an author, obviously J.R. Tolkien, favorite fantasy author probably of all time, um, uh, as an intellectual and as a person and just as a, you know, specifically as an intellectual, you know, we're going to talk about him later, uh, in a couple weeks, I'm sure. But C.S. Lewis, it's very hard to beat C.S. Lewis as an intellectual. But, um, uh, it, very true. Um, but J.R. Tolkien complained to C.S. Lewis a lot about the Chronicles of Narnia, specifically because he mixed together so many mythologies in writing it. And J.R. Tolkien is like, look, everything in this book is either my own creation based off of uh, British folklore or it's British folklore. And... C.S. Lewis he said, and look, you have, I see Greek, I see British, I see this and that, I see stuff that you've created, I see all this. He said, why have you done all this? And C.S. Lewis is basically like, because screw you, that's why. Because screw you. <laughs> I care not. Yeah, and that's, you know, yeah. and I do like... Top shelf. I like the fiction of... of Tolkien better than I like the fiction of C.S. Lewis. But when you get into C.S. Lewis's works, and we're going to get into this later, um, uh, but just, just to say, I, I have to say this, though, now that I'm talking about that, because I'm kind of, because this is the Tolkien episode, I'm kind of ragging on C.S. Lewis a little bit. So now I just have to say, and I just have to kind of state this as the, 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 the thing. C.S. Lewis's uh, both his like nonfiction like opinion works and then also his like theological works. I have never read anything more brilliant than that. I mean, like theologically speaking, like I like yeah I yeah I have a good understanding of what's going on. I know what I I know what I believe. I know what's going on here. I know it's what's this. And then it was like I do this really like yeah I've I've read everything that Paul has written at least that we you know have put in the the King James Bible. Um, I've read all this and I've parsed it and I know what's going on here. Um, uh, I I know this stuff. I am theologically speaking, I'm a genius. And then I read C.S. Lewis's theological works. And I'm like, hmm. 
You know, I have never once considered that. <laughs> yeah. It, so, so there aren't a lot. I mean, you're talking about being theologically sound, and mm-hmm. obviously that's the whole point. Yeah. There are very, very, very <clears throat> few individuals mm-hmm. that we consider to be theological philosophers mm-hmm. um, that are also not annoying as balls. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> and... And and C.S. Lewis is pretty much the one, as far as I'm concerned. Um, mm-hmm. And there there is a, a lot of we shouldn't be talking about this, so we don't say everything that we want to say next week. But it's worth it is worth mentioning. Uh, his insight is extraordinary um, it, to a degree of, like you said, someone who was who spent their entire life around the thing he's talking about, and you're still going, "Wow, I no, I've never thought about that." Mm-hmm. Never thought about that, which is pretty incredible to do. That's a, that's a that's a very smart man. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, I, I'm to, I'm to the extent that I would, I would just as, <clears throat> I would just as soon. And some people would would call me a blasphemer for saying this, but to me, it's absolutely the same thing. Um, uh, like because in, in anything <laughs> written under the inspiration is written under the inspiration. I would just as soon, um. Uh, uh, use mere Christianity as doctrine as Paul's letters. Hmm. Yeah, sure. Uh, I could say it on the same level. Yeah, because like any, anything, again, I, in my opinion, anything written under the inspiration is written under the, written under the inspiration. And you can't read mere Christianity and say this was not written under the inspiration. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. We are getting drastically off topic of stuff I really want to talk about next time, though. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, <laughs> cause we, we, Cause that's going to be that's going to be a very in depth discussion. Yeah, we be that way. But anyways, uh, since we're on religion we and we're be. supposed to be talking about Tolkien, um, uh, I'm going to talk about this. Um, I know what Tolkien believed, and um, uh, uh, and y- you, you Tyler, you know my opinion of Catholicism. You filthy Catholic. Um. Uh, that's me, <clears throat> but uh, very nearly. Yeah, you 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 know my my opinion of that and how because of the modern fundamentals, especially the modern fundamentals of Catholicism, how extremely difficult it is uh, to remain biblically sound while being while, while professing Catholicism. Um, uh, and a hundred percent, in my opinion, Tolkien did it. <laughs> he did that thing that I said is nearly impossible to do. Because I know what he, he talked about what he believed. I know what he believed. And like if if there is if if there is such a thing as a truly God fearing Christian Bible believing Catholic, it was Tolkien. First of all, hey. Um <laughs> Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um There's not a lot there's not a lot of people that fit that category. Mm-hmm. Surprisingly, um, uh, I was I was very surprised to hear. Sp- speaking of such things, it's very possible for uh, unless you were lying through your teeth, which I come to expect from you all the time. Um, uh, this is fair. I surprisingly, I could possibly say the same thing about the uh, about your priest. Oh yeah, no, he's great. <clears throat> mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. Dustin's fantastic. Mm-hmm. I'm not Catholic Catholic, so I can just say Dustin. <laughs> <laughs> Padre, so it's so it's so it's just mm. Dustin. <laughs> um, but either way, we are really getting off topic now. You're you're not offended if <laughs> I don't call you father, are you? Oh no, no, I'm not offended at all. Good, because I wasn't going to. <laughs> because I wasn't going to. He's like, no, no, please. If you're not Catholic, call me daddy. <laughs> 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 oh man. Anyways. Uh, if I was Catholic I'd have gone to hell just then. <laughs> yeah, do not pass go. Oh. Okay. Um I don't know if there's too much more to say about the Tolkien thing. Um Yeah. There might be a point that you're thinking of that I'm not, but I think we hit on the things we were going to hit on and then very aggressively went past. <laughs> yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, we went, let's see, my recording says 56 minutes, uh, so we probably have 40 minutes of good material in there. Um, uh, so I, th- I think that's pretty hey. good. So yeah, I think, um, 
Yeah, I th I think that's that's not too bad. Um, uh, so yeah, that's that's gonna be the end of it of, of what we're talking about here. Uh, next week we will be talking about um, Lord of the Rings video games. We kind of have like one and a half slash four in mind. Um, uh, and the reason why I said it is because it's four separate video games. But it's one is kind of, but it's uh, games that are kind of the same in most ways. Um, uh, and we have some other game, we have some other things uh, that we want to talk about. If it's not going to last very long to talk about those games, we have another game that will take considerably more time to talk about. And then uh, between those games, those four slash one and a half slash five games that we want to talk about next week. Plus all the rabbit holes we're going to go down and all the tangents that we're going to go on. We may be able to have a full episode out of that. If not, we'll have something else to ramble about. So, uh, I have a strong feeling we're going to get off on some aggressive rabbit trails talking about the games. <clears throat> yeah, guaranteed we will chase every rabbit and kick every dog. It's what's going to happen. Um, uh, I already kicked dogs. Yeah. <clears throat> well, it's because your dogs, for the most part, suck. But... <clears throat> Oh, you know. Yes, yeah, so that's that's the end of it. We'll see you guys next week when we talk about uh, Lord of the Rings video games. I'm sure it'll be exciting for us. And not for you. <laughs> and not for you. So don't even listen. What's wrong with you? Why are you here? Go do something interesting. Yeah, like, we're not trying to drive you away, but there's better things to do than listen to us. <laughs> like I don't know take a poop <laughs> sniff it measure it you know something more interesting send pictures to <laughs> our business email oh yeah we have we have a discord guys <laughs> uh, it will be linked in every episode until I get a website set up and the discord will be linked in there um uh but uh definitely send pictures I'll set up a uh, I'll, I'll set up a new channel in there uh, just for poop pictures. Don't think I won't. Please send, please send pictures of your poop. <clears throat> Nothing in there but pictures. What can be better? Pictures than that? of poops you have taken. <laughs> Don't think I'm joking. It'll be in there. Actually, hold on. Wait, 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 wait. No, we're not leaving until I make this channel. There we go. Uh, interactions and such. Create channel, text channel, channel name, poop pictures. Create channel. Poop pictures, or hold on, hold on, hear me out, mm -hmm. hear me out. Yeah. Do you want to go with poop, or just go right with a poopy scoop? A poopy scoop. I like the poopy scoop. Uh, I was trying to be alliterative with poop pictures. Well, that's fine, too. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. That channel legitimately well. exists now, so do your worst. Literally. Because mm. <clears throat> do... Uh, relates do, to do do your worst it's a joke of, do, it's a joke bye everybody good day. <laughs>